Well, good morning, good evening. Uh, just a second, choose my language. Well, I guess I'd better choose English. <laughs> okay. Um, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone around the world. And thank you for joining YSI and myself and all the wonderful translators who are speaking in Russian and Chinese and German. Uh, thank you so much, Spanish. Uh, and thank you, uh, Worldview Producers, for producing this, this small talk that I'm giving today. So for some people, especially people in China, really we're on this cusp of the year of the dragon. For the rest of us, we've had our new year and we're into enjoying the this new year and the year of the dragon. Uh, and for me right now, it means I'm up here in Canada and, and enjoying my family. But wherever you are and whoever you're with, this is a conversation that I just thought would be fun and maybe some have some meaning for you. Uh, some way that you could enjoy your life a little bit more. Uh, but oftentimes the new year, it's it's all about renewing ourselves. It's uh, a chance to renew our relationships. Uh, if you're even just joining this call, there are new relationships for you to enjoy here. If you're in China or you are somewhere where you're going to enjoy the Chinese New Year, then it means that you're about to enjoy some family time, some holiday time. If you're Karina, you've just gone back to see your mom and your family. Um, but wherever you are, it is a chance to renew. Every day is a chance to renew yourself and renew your relationships with others. It's a wonderful way to start the day, to think like that. And so whatever you plan to do with your day or plan to do with the next few weeks, if it's the spring festival you're planning to enjoy, I really would love on behalf of YSI for you to be the best that you can be. And you have to think about what that means for you. For me, it really does mean meeting every situation, every person with as much happiness and joy as I, and focus as I can have towards them. So whoever you're with, whether it's families, or friends. Why well, I would love for your families to feel warmed at the side of you, your friends to feel that, that same thing. Oh, it's it's Karina, it's Anastasia, it's Svetlana I'm seeing right now. I'm so happy they're here. It's difficult sometimes when we return to the same people and same situations. We are, our minds set us to expect a certain kind of a response and our minds produce that response. But you can overcome it. You can decide that I would like to walk the world with joy. And I would like to enjoy every moment of the, those that I'm with and have them enjoy my company too. And wouldn't it be wonderful all the time to have this small sense of sadness or just a wish to return, just a wish to see them again. So just thinking about the fact 
that the year, this idea of a dragon, these mythical creatures, they are known to hoard wisdom and hoard jewels. So they like to keep the wisdom to themselves. But as we know, keeping wisdom to ourselves, well, it's not the smartest thing to do. So I thought we'd borrow some wisdom from a wise sage named Nagarjuna. So Nagarjuna, he was very much revered by dragons and humans alike. And he said this one beautiful thing. He was talking about correlations. And he was saying that, you know, someone who serves the world with joy or those around them with joy, that person walks in the world with grace. If we serve those around us with joy, we walk in the world with grace. He wrote many surprising cause and results correlations. But this one, the correlation between serving with joy and having a life with others that is graceful, meaning it's an ease that we walk in the world. It's with ease that we step into the next thing that we do. It's not with the expectation that there might be a problem. It's not with the expectation that there might be a conflict. It's with the expectation that we can wholly be present, lovingly be present to those around us. And this result, I think, is really something worth working towards. It's really something worth exploring. So grace is a very interesting word. It can mean having very elegant movements, but it also can mean being blessed by gifts that make our passage, our way in the world as a very peaceful, very healthy, very happy. And it can also mean that our relationships, well, they're very satisfying and they can be sweet. They can be fulfilling. They could be challenging if that's what we want. And then grace has this very aristocratic, aristocratic, aristocratic is the word I want to use, aristocratic connotation like regalness. In Greek mythology, they have these three graces, they call, which are three goddesses. And it can also, grace can also mean to do something willingly and happily. And it also can mean to be lucky. To be lucky is kind of a, we don't often think of luck as something very, it's just something that happens by chance. But if you're on this call, you might be aware that it is very, nothing happens by chance. So it usually means that you've already done the work to create this luck. You just know that you've done the work to create this luck. So whether it is to be blessed with an elegance of movement, to have fulfilling relationships, to be very regal, to have my socks tied right, <laughs> or even to be lucky, 
it usually, what it does really mean is that we've planted the causes. We've planted the causes for this kind of life and the cause is serving others with joy. So if you want to be lucky, you want to be regal, you want to have great relationships, you want to be one of those people who moves through the world with this ease, then serve others with joy. In the lineage of Lady Naguma, in the 16th century, there was a great yogi named Master Taranatha. And he was the one who was responsible for re really bringing Lady Nguma's yoga, as we know it currently, into the public eye. And Master Taranatha was a great historian. He was a Sanskrit scholar. He was an amazing teacher. He was also a great leader, an amazing builder and uh, interior decorator, you might say. And he was also a peacekeeper. He was somebody who gave advice to others to help them stop war. He didn't live an easy life. And at the end of his life, just a few years before his death, in his autobiography, he writes, what motivated me most in life was serving others. And what troubled me most in life was serving others. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be lovely if every in the one in the world was motivated most by serving others and was never troubled by serving others? So I've had a little bit of time to think about why it's a problem to be troubled by serving others, especially if you understand seeds. How many of you on the call, if I can see you, or you can put it in the chat, how many of us, myself included, feel that we've reached the limit of our capacity to serve others at times. And what is it that brings on that feeling of having reached the limit, our personal limit? Is it exhaustion? Is it just too many people it feels we have to serve? Is it pressure? Too many things to do? I know I have felt times that there was, I couldn't do any more. And sometimes it's just feeling torn between what I want to do for me and the commitments that I've made to others. But if we think about Aryana Garjana's statement that all things come with ease to those who serve with joy, 
Thank you, Pita. I see negative emotions. Yeah, it's true for me too. Negative emotions really uh, put a limit on my capacity to serve. But if we think about what comes to us, if we can serve with joy, then it makes it very important to try to reach that edge, even with a negative emotion, even though we might have something like a negative emotion happening. Tiredness, sleepiness actually are part of negative emotions. It's really important to push our edge of being able to serve with joy. And then stop and serve ourselves with joy too. And also, if you think about it, I was, it's no different really than growing our capacity to do a yoga pose. When we're learning a new pose or trying to develop our yoga feeling a little discomfort at the edge of a pose is a good thing leaning into it breathing into it that's what grows our mental and physical strength grows our mental and physical muscle So we can take joy in pushing the edge of our asana practice just a little because that makes a body stronger, makes our body more capable of serving. And using our joy at the edge of our capacity to serve, it's the same. It's, our joy is a transformative factor for growth. And it has this amazing benefit to bring grace to us in all its forms so that we can walk through the world with ease. And when we walk through the world with ease, it's so much easier to serve. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know about other languages, but ease and easier and easiest, all of these things say things to me like, wow, it's easy to get on Zoom. It's easy to find the people I want to talk to. And this morning, I hopped on a Zoom link where there was nobody. <laughs> I'm like, wow, nobody's here. It's 10 to the hour, what's going on? But with the ease of Telegram, I texted Bob and, and Bob and Earl were immediately there to respond. Hmm, try this link, Connie. <laughs> anyway, that's what happens when you walk through the world with joy. Ease comes to you. It's hard to imagine doing what we do currently without this kind of ease. It means that all of us on this call have been living our lives with joy. But what happens when we don't have joy? When we feel like Master Taranatha being troubled by serving others it means that our minds are sinking into complaining, maybe even regretting. What effect does that have on walking through the world with ease? Well, it limits our capacity to enjoy the result. Maybe it even blocks the result. And everything 
is all the harder for them. It's harder to be able to get on a Zoom call. It's harder to wake up early in the morning. Harder to stay up late and listen to a talk about joy. So just regretting, just complaining, just allowing ourselves even to sink into a little bit of negativity when we really want to have joy. It destroys the effect or blocks the effect that we want to come to us so that we can have more joy. We walk in the world struggling to get what we want. And sometimes all it means is to look around and become aware. Sorry, my battery is low, it says. Uh oh, there's a case of not being able to walk in the world with ease. <laughs> nope. Might have to just change out my plug. Just give me a second. That help? Not yet. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to keep talking until I can find a tool that works for me. <laughs> and yesterday I was with my mom and I had such a wonderful time. John and I, that's the reason why we're here in Canada. Yay! Okay. <laughs> All right. That's the reason why we're here. Is My mom is uh, 96 years old. And for me, sometimes it's hard to put away my work. And I have to deliberately leave my phone behind. I have to deliberately choose to leave my computer behind uh, just so that I can have the yoga of playing cards with my mom. <laughs> At 96 years old, there's not a whole lot that she can do. She uses a walker now. And I feel so lucky that she is still alive. And uh, John and I were yesterday fully present to enjoying our time with her in the way that she wanted to enjoy time with us. And we just had so much fun. It was wonderful to be fully present and to leave feeling that we used that time so well. My mom still does yoga, <laughs> but only one day a week, only on Wednesdays, that's today. Um, she does it with my brother Dennis still well she will only do yoga once a week she play cards any day with joy whatever it is and however it is you want to engage with others in the world just do it fully make your focus full of them and bring joy to it. So in Lady Naguma's yoga, this kind of caring for others with the fullness of our focus and having this kind of happiness in our minds, it's part of what we call the yoga of everyday life. 
And it is the cause that produces the grace and the ease of our physical asana. And so I was thinking, even though mom limits her yoga to once a week, she really enjoys that effort. And her heart is really bad. I think it's amazing sometimes that she is still alive, that it's still beating. It was very hard for her to stop driving, but she had to because she just we just don't know when it will stop. But she loves doing her yoga with my brother, Dennis. And Dennis, I have been together with him. Dennis won't pull any punches if mom wants to do and find her edge with her yoga, he lets her find it. She's doing her yoga with joy and her life then becomes more joyful. So we can do that with those we love. If we just decide we want to move through life with ease, then decide we will enjoy caring for those we love. And eventually, we can learn to love everyone equally. So try to notice when your husband or wife, your children, friends, parents, your grandparents, co-workers and employees could use some joy from you, could use a helping hand. And little by little, slowly, build your capacity to serve. Build your capacity to see what others need. Of course, nobody but ourselves knows what our capacity is. And it's up to us to find that edge, lean into it, and grow. So for anybody on the call who is familiar with the idea of planting seeds, I'm talking about using the four steps. I'm talking about the intelligence of using a powerful emotion to speed up the growth of our seeds, to have the results walking through life with ease come quickly. to make our dreams come true. So if you're in China and you're looking forward to this holiday, spring festival, those you love, or you're anywhere else in the world and you just want to enjoy your life, just want to walk together with those you are with, with ease, It's not hard, just stop for a moment and reflect on what you did to serve others today or yesterday or the day before that and be happy for what you did. So I'm going to just run through a few simple steps so that you can do this easily when you wake up tomorrow or apply it all to this day. When you wake up, just decide, look, I want that easy life. I want to be able to step into a world where it's easy to serve others. And decide you're gonna do the practice 
of joy in order to make that happen. You can choose one person or you can choose three people or even in just a circumstance where you will meet people today. And in each one, choose someone or choose many someones that you will serve with joy no matter what. Maybe you can check for obstacles like laziness <laughs> that might come up or tiredness or pressure, things that will demand your attention. Maybe they will. And maybe they won't, but who cares? If you want to walk in the world with ease, choose to focus with joy completely on those people in those moments that you decided you would do it for. And then be happy whenever you reflect on what you did. It's easy and it's fun. Ooh. Um, I want to open it up to Q and A, if that's okay. Oh, so I wonder if someone could point out the first questions. I see one here that is about. It's from Suyi. Suyu, uh, Suyi. And they're asking about Kundalini. Uh, and can it be opened by the practice of Tumo? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> Let me just say yes. Uh, that is also part of Lady Naguma's practice. It's not a practice. I mean, we talk about it in Lady Naguma Foundation One. Actually, it's in class four. Earl will talk about it. And so, it, but it's not a practice that we teach. It's there, but there is a lot of preparation, usually, that must come first. And I say usually, because like me, and like I've seen on the call, many of us have negative emotions and things that happen that don't allow our winds to come to the central channel. And that's very necessary, very necessary for that practice. So it's a practice that's usually reserved for someone who's been practicing for a long time. And who knows, maybe just with the practice of joy, it'll happen spontaneously. Okay. I don't know if I see any other questions or if there's something here that needs to be translated. Oh, someone did, thought there are questions. Thank you. Um, what if that person wants to spend time in an unethical way? Very good question. Would you want to spend time with joy in an unethical way? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. In that case, it does take a little bit of extra work. But everybody has things that they enjoy that are ethical. And find those ones, if it's a loved one, that you want to spend with time with. Just let them know, this is how I will spend my time with you. This is how I want to enjoy my time with you. And I can't do that other thing. And so when they're ready, uh, or even in small ways. I mean, everybody needs 
company to go shopping or might need company for my mom needs that. <laughs> uh, just in conversations, if you're with people, just be happy in that conversation. Find something small, slowly, bit by bit. That's your yoga with them. It's not yoga to do something that is harmful to them or yourself. You don't have to be uh, harsh about it. Just choose when you know that they are in a state of mind that is positive, a state of mind that is open to sharing in something in an ethical way. I would say that, start small. Oh, thank you, Dape. She said, it's hard to spend time with your mother-in-law during the Chinese New Year. Oh, it's hard to open the imagination. And it's too hard to think of someone as an angel who's special if they do a lot of crushing of things. I, I thought actually of you, of people who were going to experience this during this next couple of weeks. And that's why I chose this talk, because I know there are many people who return to repetitive, painful situations. And in those cases, I would say start small too. If you have the chance to limit the time you can spend together, make that time joyful. Just small, but joyful. If you have to leave, if you're staying together, if you have to leave, go for a walk. What you're doing is resetting her mind and your mind in a way to want a better experience together. It takes a little bit of time. And sometimes it's true. Angels come in our life to help us push that edge. And we have to do it ourselves with wisdom. We have to find the way to be with a mother-in-law who isn't always joyful or who crushes or has crushed our feelings in the past. So set your intention at the very beginning of the day. And then it's like you have to put some armor on before you step into your mother-in-law's presence and then leave, know when it's time to leave. Put a zipper across your mouth, keep the smile on your face and then go. It's, it's a kindness to yourself and to her that eventually she will want and she will want to be with you when you are happy. So I agree, it's not easy. And that's exactly why I chose this talk because I know some of us will go home to be with people that we want to love and we want to feel joy with, we want to serve, but we know we're going to encounter images that our minds put out there of somebody who crushes our joy. In those cases too, try to find places where you might be crushing somebody else's joy and make a plan to stop that. It can be just a small thing too. It's hard to see. 
we have blind spots. I know for sure I have them. And I know that's what causes the joy crushers in my world. How are we doing? Okay. Um, oh, so Ying, Ying Ying, thank you for this question. When doing asana practice, how do you keep your breathing controlled without being too tense or overly controlled? And where is this balance point? It's true. Some pose, pose, uh, poses like Ardha, Mats Matsya, and Drasana, they're meant to push the edge of your breath in order to stimulate other things. When you find the edge is pushed, especially in poses like that, you're meant to straighten up and then find the ease that you can find in the pose. You can't breathe fully and deeply in some poses, but you, what you do is take it, still trying to use that very soft ujjayi breathing at the back of your throat. Take your focus away from uh, I would say put your focus mostly on the breath at that point. Look, scan your body. Find the way to get most the, of the ease that you can in the pose, most of the relaxation that you can in the pose. So you push it to the edge and you come back a little bit. Push it to the edge and come back a, a little bit. But it means that you have to keep your focus on the pose and not decide I'm going to leave the pose because it's too difficult. Stay there with it. See what is and is not there in terms of being difficult or unbalanced. And then come to the breath and try to take the breath as fully as you can. Taking the breath as fully as you can relaxes the body. That would be my advice, but I know there are people probably like Benji and Earl and Nicole who will give you even better advices. Time for, oh, I'm at the point of Tracy's uh, question. Let me see if I can answer it quickly. Tracy's asking, what about when there is more than three? And sometimes you have to say no because of your timeline. How do you do that with equanimity and feel okay? And not feel guilty with trying to do your best with what you can and still be able to maintain some balance in life. Oh, I love this question. Thank you, Tracy. Because it means Tracy is pushing her edge. It means that she's creating these challenges for herself in the world. I know I reach them. And it is the case of being present to say happily to somebody, I will get back to you. I will. Maybe right now I can't, but I will. And if you say that, and you know, if you're, you've already made commitments, then those you have to keep. Up. If you haven't made commitments, begin the process of looking to see who needs you most. Who needs you most is where you need to be. And that's all. And you do it little by little by making the best choices you can in the moment. You make the best choice and then you just leave it at that. 
you know you made your best choice. And that's all. And be joyful about what you did. Okay, so I I want to actually invite you, since we're on the call, um, to come to the next Lady Nukuma Foundation Level 1 course. We are going to be running a course in China. Uh, and these courses will be guided. Uh, oh, you can see it on the screen here. They will be guided by some amazing uh, distributors in China with great teams of people to help you through the foundation, the master level, and the teacher training. We just had some wonderful graduates. Uh, we saw a lot, I saw a lot of pictures of all of these individuals who came through their trainings. And while YSI teachers are there, uh, we are beginning to see some beautiful teachers emerging in China who've gone through these Lady Naguma trainings. So I'd invite you to take that QR, take an image of that QR code, and please join um, our distributors in China for this next Lady Naguma course. The philosophy is amazing, and the lineage is pure. We have really wonderful instructors who are deeply trained and well-practiced. And I really do believe in part because of the lineage and because it was passed on so purely through my teacher that this course is one of the best you can take. It's also even, how can I put it? The service that is provided to you through the distributors of YSI is amazing. They take care to make sure you can practice together with others. They take care to make sure that you grow in your practice. So please take down that QR code and visit the YSI website to get the links to the distributors that will offer the Lady Nukuma course throughout the year. And you can see the dates there, I think. The first one starts in March, yeah, March 22nd to the 25th. So on behalf of YSI, I wish you the grace of being the best that you can be. And wherever you are, whatever you're doing, have a wonderful day, a wonderful sleep, a wonderful holiday. Thank you.